So um, you can fill up. You could come and get that. Well, it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Father Rentel Alexander here to the, to the parish. I want to um, just say a few words about who this lecture is uh, uh, in honor of, and that's uh, Metropolitan Leonte. Um, uh, Father Leonid at that time uh, uh, was rector here, as well as he was a priest here, as well as rector of the seminary that was across the street, first rector, and that was by appointment by uh, St. Tikhon. And so uh, there's a great connection. I like this connection because then that, parrot, that seminary was eventually moved to New York City, which became St. Vladimir's. And if you go to St. Vladimir's, you'll see a brick from this parrot, from that, from that they built the original building there at, at St. Vladimir's. Um, Father Leonard was a, um, uh, served here and then uh, had a very uh, long career in, um, in North America and also um, with the church under the direction of, of St. Tikhon and also served at that time also um, uh, also uh, was part of the council and, um, in Moscow right before the revolution. Um, and so had a very, had a long, had connections both in the, in the, uh, the United States as well as, as in Russia. Um, he had five children and when he would be, when his, unfortunately his, his wife died, uh, later he became, he raised them and also then became a monastic. Um, and from there he was eventually appointed uh, to um, serve as primate uh, uh, for uh, after 15 years and 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 died and um, fell asleep in the Lord in 1965. I think one of the most interesting things I've heard about and read about Metropolitan Leonti is is not sort of um, although he did many great things, but how what a humble, loving person he was, a real icon of Christ um, that he was. Um, and forbearance and thoughtfulness and generosity um, and uh, with a sense of humor um, and vision as well as great learning and erudition. And so it's with great pleasure that we welcome Father Alexander um, to, to honor our Metropolitan Leonti. Father Alexander um, uh, received his MDiv uh, in 1995 from St. Vladimir's and he uh, finished his doctoral dissertation um, at the Pontifical or, uh, Oriental, Oriental Institute in Rome with the great Father um, Robert Taft, who is the, it's probably the preeminent, one of the preeminent scholars on, lit, on, on liturgy, has written numerous books on that. Um, prior to coming to St. Vladimir's professor, he was a junior fellow at the Byzantine Institute at Dunbar Oaks, um, and he has taken numerous, he, he's, he's world traveled. Uh, and it has been a great example and witness of uh, the OCA, a uh, minister of the OCA to, um, throughout the world. He was deemed the priesthood in 2001, and he has a, his wife Nancy, and we're fortunate to have his, one of his sons, Timo, Dimitrios, uh, and he has a, a daughter Maria and Daniel. Uh, I know Demi, Dimitrios and Daniel well because when I was in the DVP program, they used to boss us around <laughs> at the, uh, at the, to tell us where, to tell these baby deacons or pre-deacons where to go. Uh, and so lovely. So today, uh, Father, um, Father Alexander is going to talk to us about one of his great passions, and that's the liturgy um, and the, and the um, importance of the liturgy in our lives and the importance of liturgy daily. Um, I was struck, I remember, uh, First, hearing Father in the in the program at St. Vladimir's, they have some of the some of the professors give talks to the to the to the to the um, folks uh, studying to be deacons, and I was really struck by his his talk that he gave about the liturgy. It, it really changed my view of what how the liturgy should be viewed and how it would and how we should approach the liturgy um, and its importance. Um, Father's, Father's talk today is going to be what is the big deal about liturgical theology, personal witness and participation in liturgical experience. Welcome, Father Alexander. <clears throat> uh, 
Your Eminence, uh, Reverend Fathers, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, I greet you on this beautiful Saturday. <sighs> beautiful Saturday in the fall. Uh, apple picking orchards are not far, no doubt. Uh, the busyness of our lives lay close at hand, of course. There are many things to do, and so I always consider it uh, just a miracle when uh, anybody, when everybody is able to come out and willing to come out for any sort of church event. So I welcome you, I give thanks to God for your presence this morning, and I thank Father Andrew uh, for inviting me. Um, I don't know, I don't, I don't even remember when it was ago, but I rem the only thing I remember is my schedule was clear at the time. Now my schedule is quite full, but I'm still grateful for the opportunity to come and be with you today. As Deacon Philip was saying, I'm gonna to speak to you today about the liturgical services. And I would just say as just a preface to everything, if you, I'm, I'm Father Alexander Rentel, perhaps you know my father, Father Daniel Rentel, Rentel uh, and he's a priest in Columbus, Ohio, a priest of this diocese, and has been so for many, many years, since the early 70s. And in fact, before we moved to Columbus, Ohio, he was serving two parishes in rural central Pennsylvania, Zach knows where they are, um, in a town called Patton, which is on the map on Google Maps, but also a town called Uri, which is not on Google Maps to give you an idea of how small it actually is. Anyway, he was servicing these two churches on any given Sunday, and my mother said, oh, Dan, you really need to take Alexander with you, and he needs to spend time with you. And no joke, I like this. I like to lay this card down at the outset of my talks. Um, it was two and a half years old when I started serving with my father. And in one capacity or another, you know, I've been serving in the altar as an altar boy, uh, somewhat of a subdeacon, uh, as a deacon, and now as a priest since then. And I give thanks to God for that opportunity. And I will say, and I will actually address this, I don't know why I'm saying it now, it's kind of out of order, but many of the questions, or let me put it this way, many of the things I'm gonna to say today actually have emerged out of questions that I have actually had over the course of my uh, you know, time in the altar. So I, I turned 54 last March, so I would say, Dima, what is that, 51 and a half years of pondering, you know, what am I doing in the services have led me to some of these answers. Now, I'll try and back that up with more than just anecdotal, well, I think this, but much of what I say will have to come out of that. Again, I thank you for coming today, and I know, as I say, the busyness of the world, you know, lays close at hand. I feel that way. I made an illusion when I said Father Andrew invited me. My schedule is clear. Now it's full. I bet your schedules are full. I bet if I pulled out your phone and pulled out your calendar app, whether it's Fantastical or Google Calendar or just the native app, whatever it is, I bet there are all sorts of things around this weekend. And I bet even now while I'm speaking, you're saying, you know, I got to do food shopping. I got to pick up the kids. I got to get this and do this. God has brought us together for this moment. We have about three hours. You know, I have about two hours worth of talk and it's some time for question and then we have some time for fellowship and refreshments. So what I would just say at the outset is, maybe we can just try and turn all of those things off. And I'm gonna to try too, don't get me wrong, I'm not perfect and I'm not saying do something that I'm gonna do, but I am gonna to strive to do that. Uh, turn off Facebook, not even literally, but just get rid of that compulsion. Turn off Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, Demetrius, um, all of these sorts of things. Just turn them off. Don't think about food shopping. Don't think about the calendar. Now, let's just take a moment. I actually think that it's, it's, it's good, and it might seem kind of odd, but let's just take a minute. And I'm going to stop talking in a minute. But just quietly, let's just take a second. Find a moment. Find some peace and ask the Lord to grant us, and literally, the willingness and the strength to get through three hours for him, free of distraction. So I'm not gonna say let's pray because, well, we could pray, but let's just take a minute and be quiet. There are many things, as I say, in our life that we're called to do. But one thing I'm gonna put forward today is there's almost nothing, of import, nothing as important in our lives as the liturgical assembly. 
I'm going to say this again and again without hyperbole, without overstating it. Attending liturgy, doing the things that I'm going to try and encourage us to do on a regular basis in liturgical services is, and I'll try and prove this to you, a matter of life and death. So it behooves us, as I say, to put aside this time and dedicate it, uh, you know, for a moment to be edified, to be encouraged. And I pray that God give me the words, the insight, and I hope I am able to convey by the grace, by God's grace, uh, some of the answers to questions and may it be wisdom, may them be wise hmm, that I have acquired over the years. Now, before I start, now that I've got everybody in a solid mood, I have to make one caveat. I'm old, I'm, I said, I'm 54. You know what I learned how to write? I learned how to write with a pen and paper. And so I still write with a pen and paper. No one needs to know that. The problem is, is sometimes I can't read my writing. <laughs> so if I, if I hesitate for a minute, I'm sorry. My kids, they'll tell you it's really bad. Anyway, so if I stumble for a moment, if I go back, it's only because of my own fault. So please bear with me. So this is, of course, uh, the Metropolitan Leonti Memorial Lecture. And during this, I want to speak, as Deacon Philip was saying, what is the big deal about liturgical theology? And even if I say liturgical theology and you're turned off from that because you say, oh, that sounds like some classroom work, Father. Give me a minute, please, I beg your attention, okay? Just bear with me until I get to what I mean by that. What is the big deal about liturgical theology? And it's gonna be about personal witness and participation in the liturgical experience, which I believe to be fundamental, absolutely fundamental. And I might say all sorts of questionable things, but that's something I'm not gonna give on. And whether I'm right or wrong, God knows, but this is something I feel convicted of, you know, deep in my life. Now, I wanna to get to that in a minute, but let's, I wanna just set the stage a little bit more with regard to uh, the topic at hand, because what I'm gonna be speaking about is uh, some assertion and some formulations that were put forward by Father Alexander Schmemann. This is a hundredth year, uh, celebrating the hundred year anniversary of his birth, 1921, 2021. Um, and so it seems fitting to speak about him, but it seems especially fitting to speak about him, Father Alexander Schmemann, uh, at the Me Metropolitan Leonti uh, Memorial Lecture. And I wanna begin with a vivid account, you know, a, a very, mm, I love this, I love this story, I love this anecdote. And it, it took place, or it recounts an episode that took place in 1963 on a rainy evening at St. Vladimir's Seminary. This is when, you know, Father Alexander Schmemann was Dean of St. Vladimir's Seminary. And he was alerted, uh, you know, via telephone call of a desire of a Russian hierarch, Metropolitan Nikodim of Leningrad. And I mean of Leningrad, it was Leningrad there, not St. Petersburg, now you would say St. Petersburg. But at the time it was Leningrad. So it was Metropolitan Nikodim of Leningrad. And he was a bright light on the Holy Synod of Bishops of the Moscow Patriarchate. Anyway, Father Alexander Schmemann was alerted that this Metropolitan Nikodim wanted to visit St. Vladimir's Seminary. And he said, oh yeah, great. And you know, the story is that he came <laughs> very soon after a bus pulled up to the seminary and out came about 20 Russian clergymen, uh, visitors, and of course, Metropolitan Nikodim. And the, the delegation went immediately up to the seminary chapel and they joined in the prayers at Vespers. That's what was happening at the seminary at the time and that gives you roughly the time of day, about five, 5.30, yeah? Now, Metropolitan Nicodem, as I say, visiting the seminary, he went to Father Alexander and he said, Father Alexander, the time is right to resolve our differences. And at this point, the Russian, the Moscow Patriarchate, and the Metropolia, which became the Orthodox Church in America, they were estranged, and this is a longer story, but you just, I can just say they were estranged. There were some canonical difficulties. Um, Father Schmemann responded, of course, that he could and he should and he would arrange a meeting later between, uh, with Metropolitan Nicodem and his delegation uh, with Metropolitan Leonti, who was the Metropolitan of the Metropolia at the time. Um, and so a few days later, Father Alexander recounts that Metropolitan Nicodem and his delegation, along with uh, 
Father Alexander Schmemann and a number of other people went to Syosset, where I work, where we have the Chancery of the Orthodox Church in America together, you know, which at that point, though, was not the Chancery. It was only the residence of Metropolitan Neonti. So they went there to the residence where Metropolitan Neonti was. Um, and uh, Father Schmemann vividly recounts, yeah, he said, I will never forget, yeah, he says, I will never forget the nearly 90-year-old Metropolitan as he slowly came down the stairs to meet the delegation. Yeah? He was dressed as usual in his white rias and his cassock. So majestic. So majestic, so sure of himself, and yet so simple and joyful. So obviously uh, the head of the church in which he had given his entire life. Father Alexander recounts uh, that after dinner later, Metropolitan Leonti spoke in a manner of, quote, someone who knows where he stands and who, because he knows it, and carries it upon himself the ultimate responsibility, knew what to expect in the future. Father Alexander himself uh, felt the import of Metropolitan Leonti's words that evening. And in fact, he stated that he believed that the words also left a profound impact on Metropolitan Nicodem, which ultimately led to further discussions that brought forth the Tomos of Aracephaly uh, for the Orthodox Church in America. Now, I bring this anecdote uh, forward to your attention today because obviously this is the Metropolitan Leonti Memorial Lecture. We've gathered precisely to honor this man who knew where he stood, who carried the ultimate responsibility and knew what to expect from the future. We honor this man whose life, words, and deeds contributed mightily to the fostering, encouraging, nurturing of our church life. May God keep him eternally in his memory. May he take his place among the choir of venerable Orthodox hierarchs from all the ages. But may we, too, keep his memory alive for our own edification, lest we forget the mighty men of our own age and the deeds that they undertook the words that they spoke. Let us not forget this. Let us not lose track, in other words, of who we are. May it never be so. I think it notable and even underscores the importance of this story, you know, to just draw your attention. At this point, the churches were estranged and Metropolitan Leonti was under canonical sanction from the Moscow Patriarchy. At this point, for almost over a decade, it's an extraordinary moment, and the impact that he left is indeed, by God's grace, uh, the impact that he left on the Moscow Patriarchy. Certainly, the extraordinary evening and the encounter that they were able to come together you know, and ultimately reconcile the differences. Because these hierarchs, these delegations, these groups, they came together, they came to know each other, helped overcome much of the problem that existed between the two churches. Now, Father Alexander, Father Alexander Schmemann is our guide for the encounter that evening. He is both a witness to the event and also, of course, one of the participants. He participated. He witnessed. Metropolitan Nicodem slowly realized the categories of schism or the necessity of repentance, which were spoken of between the churches at the time, uh, or the need for the Metropolia to return to the Mother Church. He knew that such behavior, the deportment of Metropolitan Leonti, made all of these things irrelevant. Father Alexander saw and knew that Metropolitan Leonti's love for the Russian Orthodox Church and the bringing forth of the local American Church and the reality of its own life and traditions brought to the fore a greater and even more profound truth that had laid hidden behind enmity, hard feelings, and a basic lack of knowledge of the other. We are, of course, grateful to Metropolitan Leonti for his episcopacy, but we are also grateful for our guide for that evening, Father Alexander Schmemann, for his work and for his legacy, which we will now turn to next. Now, before we talk about Father Alexander, that, that Father Alexander, let me say a word about this Father Alexander. Um, make no mistake, I'm not by any means attempting to call or put myself in comparison with our father, Father Alexander Schmemann. He and I share a name, and we taught at St. Vladimir's Seminary. But believe me, I assure you, I remain inspired by him and consider myself a student of Father Alexander, and I will speak about him shortly. 
and argue that what he said was of great importance for each of us. In fact, his words can help us understand who we are and what we do as Orthodox Christians. And with this knowledge, we believe, honestly, truly, without reservation, believe that we can become better people, better Christians. Uh, you know, when I, uh, well, as I say, uh, well, I should say another word just about myself. You know, Father uh, uh, Deacon Philip introduced me. I am the Chancellor of the Orthodox Church in America. I taught at St. Vladimir Seminary. I'm a father by nature. I have three kids. I'm the son of Father Daniel Rental um, in Columbus, Ohio. I like to, I, I see myself as being a service of the church, um, you know, in almost every way uh, that, I, that God has directed or put before me to try and fulfill. Um, I do note, though, that I walk down those same steps that Metropolitan Leonti walked down. I'm sure I give nobody the sort of feeling that uh, Father Alexander received. I'm in that dining room on a regular basis. Zach, Thema, and I, we've eaten there. Um, I don't know if I've inspired either of you uh, to the same degree. Um, I try and put some thoughts together, but I remain inspired by the Metropolitan and Father Alexander, and I assure you of this. You know, but as I've already indicated, I love the services. I've loved the services since I was a boy. Uh, and when I worked at, at St. Vladimir's Seminary, I had, the, I had, the good, I had, had a good job. And I, one of my favorite things that I did was I assisted the dean, Father John Baer at the time, and then the president, Father Chad Hatfield, you know, putting on the liturgical services of the chapel. I, you know, coord helped coordinate the choirs, the assigned clergy. I taught the younger clergy how to serve. I provided the rubrical directions, you know, for the services. And, you know, every once in a while, jokingly, you know, I would say that the motto of my office, I had no office and I had no motto, but I would say uh, the, the motto of my office was more liturgy is better than less liturgy. I said that jokingly, but you know, anybody who knows me, I'm very serious about that. I take that very, very seriously. And I believe that. I am convicted with all of my being about this, and I'll try and prove this to you, or try and at least demonstrate it, why I feel this way, and hopefully convince you of this. And I would say at the outset, you know, I believe that more liturgy is better than less liturgy, because I think that the, litur the liturgical tradition, let me, just bear with me, I'm gonna get into this a little bit more, but at the outset, because our liturgical tradition, it's so biblically based, you know? I take the phrase that is offered in the second verse, this, believe it or not, the second verse of the first psalm, you know, to be synonymous with my half-joking motto. And it says, you know, blessed is a man who walks on in the counsel of the wicked, first verse, second verse, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. And here I'm just gonna, I'll lay it down. I might be wrong, but I think that meditating day and night on the law of the Lord, on the will of the Lord, you know, on what is revealed to us by the Lord to be more or less synonymous with our liturgical tradition. This sentiment, uh, sentiment, excuse me, expressed in this psalm verse, and really can be found throughout the psalms, and indeed, you know, uh, it, throughout the scriptures, and I would say it's presumed in the heavy curses that we have in our church, you know, the numerous services we have, or the lengthy services, I f you can find this sentiment, sentiment anywhere. And I assure you that while I might have said this motto, jokingly motto, lightly, I took it and I take it very seriously. I believe, I believe in the power of the liturgy. I believe in the reading and the chanting of scriptures, the hymns, the rites, the gestures by the priests, the setting, I'm overawed by the setting here to be quite honest with you, uh, the setting of the temple, everything that goes into the liturgical services and makes them up. I believe in the power of the liturgy. And I believe in the power of these services to transform hearts and minds, change lives through the imparting of knowledge, which leads to greater faith, which means that our relationship with God is greater. Uh, and, and, and one that is more, that brings us to a place where we are more loving. Now, again, just for a moment, just about me, for just a moment, 
and I'll, I'll return to, the, to these topics momentarily. You know, my confidence in this proposition, one that I'll be making, developing a little bit further, is born out of experience and study. Now, I, here I, I feel like I need to make another, you know, apology for uh, speaking in a manner that could be seen as boastful. Yeah. My name is Father Alexander. I taught at the seminary. I walked down the stairs at Metropolitan Leon. I'm not trying to boast. And here when I say that I believe in the power of the liturgy because of my own life, I'm not trying to say you. I assure you, I make no claim. I lay no claim about my life being perfect. I struggle. I fall. I sin. But I know, Vladika, brothers and sisters in Christ, that when I go to services and when I don't, I know myself. I know it like someone struggling with substance abuse. Uh, substance abuse. I know when I'm off the wagon and when I'm on the wagon. I'm simply this, a better person when I go to the liturgical services. Enough about me. I've seen in my own life the power of the liturgy affected in others. I've seen the giants, you know, of our recent world, of our recent age, the experience in the Orthodox Church. I've had the good fortune to celebrate with some of them. I've seen people who have had their lives transformed, changed, made better through the liturgical experience. Thus, I can testify to you. I can witness that in my own life, I have been able to overcome, maintain, do better, be better through what I've experienced in the services, and I've also seen the same thing and accomplished in other people. I'm not perfect, far from it. But I assure you, I could be much worse. Now, along with experience, 52 and a half years of experience of serving, of witnessing the liturgical services intimately, up close, um, I've also taken liturgy as a formal field of academic study. I went to St. Vladimir Seminary. Uh, and then I did a doctorate in liturgical studies, and then I've taught it for years. And I would just pause for a minute and say how grateful I am that I was at St. Vladimir Seminary at the time that I was. I was there with His Eminence, Archbishop Paul, and I can say, you know, Your Eminence, you could, you could say, I mean, they took the liturgical services very, very seriously at St. Vladimir Seminary. Father Hopko, Father Paul Laser, uh, Father John Breck, blessed to be one of my teachers, Father Paul Tarazzi, who's retired here, you know, at, at, in, the, in the Twin Cities. I mean, they were serious about this, serious about how you served. And it wasn't, you know, a, a sort of fantastical obsession with the, 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 the details of rubrics. No, they were trying to get something right, something far greater right. Take it very seriously because you were doing something to affect exactly what I'm talking about. The transformation, the change in people's lives. But I also feel blessed that I was able to see all of these men serve. I've heard Father Hopko give sermons. I saw Father Laser serve. One of the most beautiful liturgies I've, I remember you know, in my entire life, I saw Father John Breck, and if you know him, he's a wonderful, peaceful man, uh, very prayerful. I, I, it was a weekday service at 7 a.m. No service should be that beautiful at 7 a.m. And I remember just being so moved by it. Well, anyway, I'm grateful for that time at St. Vladimir Seminary and for what I experienced. I'm grateful to God for the doctorate and the years of study that I was able um, uh, to take advantage of. Where, you know, you, you actually study what you're interested in. It's an extraordinary thing. It's not like being in high school where somebody forces you to study something. It's like, you know, you actually get to study what you're interested in. Anyway, the, the years of, of, of teaching at St. Vladimir Seminary, uh, you know, Deacon Jason is here, Zach is here. I had them as students at the seminarians at, at St. Vladimir's. And I'm grateful also that I was able to teach classes because students ask you difficult questions. Preparing lectures, papers, and all of these things, they force you to reflect on their questions. Through their questions, they force you, excuse me, to reflect on your subject under scrutiny in difficult and different ways, and hopefully rigorous, and hopefully make your work better. So, in other words, I have not only the experience of liturgical study, but I have this formal liturgical study uh, that I've had the good fortune to. Now, I have learned in the course of my study, of course, a considerable amount from many teachers. Father Robert Taft was mentioned, but of course, Father Alexander Schmemann. Uh, Father Alexander Schmemann um, is the great dean of Orthodox theologians in the United States uh, in, in, so many, in so many ways, but especially in these fields of liturgical studies. 
Now he has helped me, and as I hope he has under, helped others, understand what I was experiencing personally, yeah, in the liturgical services, but also as, as, as a professor, what I could communicate to students by putting, putting out certain things, frames of reference, the things that I hadn't noticed, give me perspectives that I couldn't convey to others that I hadn't, con that I hadn't considered. You know, like the saying, he helped me know what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Now the field of academic liturgical theology, yeah, Oh, I can hear your eyelids drooping. I said academic liturgical theology. I can hear your minds shifting to another channel. Uh, I can see you perhaps losing some interest because I talked about academics, but hold on, bear with me. Uh, uh, hold on, bear with me for just a little bit longer. Because in his field, in, in the work that he did for academics and what we try to convey in the field of liturgical study, you know, it's really compelling. Yeah, please don't tune out, stay plugged in. There's a great wealth of treasure freely made, available to, freely made available to us in the liturgical services. And without reverting, again, to hyperbole, this is a matter of life and death. And I hope by looking at some of the things that Father Alexander Schmemann said, I can point these out to you. Now, what then, you know, what then am I talking about? No, Father Alexander Schmemann wrote a large, has a large uh, corpus of writings that he's left us. And uh, it's difficult to like boil things down to one or two things, but I'm gonna try and just for the purposes of our lecture today, for my lecture today, for our time together today, to point out one or two insights that um, he shared, which I consider to be very powerful. So what then were his insights, you know, that were, are, you know, so powerful that they have the power uh, to affect transformation? Take another diversion. Before I offer an answer to this question, let's begin in a strange place, yeah, to get to this insight. How do we arrive at this insight? Let's take a trip to Paris. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, and let's begin by imagining that we are young Alexander Schmemann walking the streets of Paris. He, of course, grew up in a Russian immigrant family, went to Russian school, attended Russian Orthodox churches, you know, and I'm interested, though, in a moment, not in those things, but I'm interested for a moment in those times when he wasn't at home, yeah? When he wasn't at a cultural event, a school or in church. You know, in fact, I'm interested in him walking down the streets of Paris, the Rue de whatever, you know, speaking in French and not in Russian, you know? No doubt, like anyone else, he succumbed to the charms of the great city of Paris, you know? Perhaps he styled his hair in a particular way. Perhaps there was a, uh, the cut of the clothes that were fashionable at the time. Perhaps with his colleagues, his chums, he spoke of contemporary events. But assuredly, yeah, this is my point, assuredly he experienced what so many Orthodox in the West have felt and we continue to feel. The uneasy cohabitation of life in the modern Western world, in, West, in the modern Western world, while belonging to an ancient Eastern Christian church. How is that circled square? I think feeling that tension helped Father Schmemann, in fact, come to the conclusions that I consider to be so important. I call to mind here Father Alexander Schmemann, walk, well, young Alexander Schmemann, walking around Paris, because of course one of his great insights was that when we enter the church building and we do liturgy, we do, we become the church. Ultimately, we become who or what we are supposed to be. Men and women experiencing, coming to know the revelation of the eternal mystery, Jesus Christ, his heavenly Father. I wonder, you know, did something click in his mind when he walked off whatever street of Paris and into a Russian Orthodox church? You know, and the bright sunlight, his eyes uh, that became uh, accustomed to the dark glow of the candlelight of the icons. You know, when the fumes and the smells of Paris gave way to the wafts of incense. Did something click in his mind, you know? Was the contrast so sharp that he was given that sort of insight? Huh? Becoming church in the church. That's unfair, of course. Uh, uh, by his own words, you know, the liturgy of the church 
is the reality and not a series of propositions. And it's unfair, as I say, to speculate, you know, it was just theological discussions that he might have had on the street with his friends went on and on, went on and on. But nevertheless, did those discussions, did everything that was happening outside exactly give way to the reality? And what provoked it? What caused him to sense that? Well, I've suggested maybe something that as he crossed the threshold, the contrast was so sharp that he was able to see it much better when it was blurred elsewhere. And indeed, if this is what happened, this is what happens in liturgy, not as, a, uh, not as when we step through the church, we are revealed something, not as a recitation or a lecture that conveys knowledge, but as an experience, you know, as a theophany, a revelation hmm, that is given over to us in words, rites, gestures, and objects, place. Again, as Father Alexander Schmemann said, the experience of the church is primarily the experience given and received in the church's liturgy. Coming off the streets of Paris into the, into the world of the church, confronting that experience, uh, that epiphany, the theophany, what is its content for him? What did he perceive? He perceived nothing less than the presence power in this world of the joy and the peace of the Holy Spirit, the kingdom itself, the new creation. All right, I'm going to stop for a minute <laughs> with these quotes, because I'm entering into exactly, I'm coming dangerously close to using overly theological words, you know, new creation, theophany, epiphany, all of these sorts of things. You know, this is a kind, I admit, I'm used to speaking in this way because uh, I've given my life to this sort of things, but may maybe this is not part of your everyday speech, you know? I assume that not everybody speaks in this way using these type of words in our day-to-day -day life. I do, but I'm somewhat different and I have a unique job in that way, you know? But then again, is there another way of saying all of this? And I would say, yes, absolutely. What he is saying about walking into the church and experiencing the theophany, experiencing the reality far away from propositions can be conveyed in different ways. And I would like to go through a couple of examples for this uh, at this point. So indeed, it can, and we can simply pay attention. Uh, the, the, the first way to do this is to simply pay attention to what is said and done in the liturgy. Some of the best advice that I can offer with regard to uh, uh, experiencing liturgical services is this. Take it seriously. Listen closely. Watch, see, understand what is being done, and then take it seriously on its own terms. Submit to it. Don't try and change it to conform to what you think you need at that moment. Enough telling. Let me show, okay? Let me show you what I mean. So for example, uh, this semester, uh, while being chancellor of the church, I'm also offering or overseeing a doctor of ministry class that is offered by St. Vladimir Seminary. And the subject of our class is uh, the Feast of the Nativity. How the church celebrates the Feast of the Nativity uh, versus basically how the, the, the Christmas holiday is marked by the world. And, uh, you know, there's a huge gulf between the two. So I have a lot of Christmas things in my head. And there are a couple of examples that I'll be bringing forward. And it's not because I'm focused in on these for any other reason than this is a class that I'm teaching at, at hand. This is the kind of thing that I have at hand. So, for example, yeah, you walk into church. Yeah, you experience something. You have reality and not some sort of discussion. You know what Father Schmemann is talking about. So you walk into church, you walk in here to St. Mary's on, you know, Christmas, Christ, the, the Christmas Eve or the night of Christmas, and you hear the wonderful choir sing out, you know, in, in, in beautiful melody according to tone, the so-called Christmas Kontakia. I trust that when I read this, it will be familiar to most people, but I'll, I'll read it and then, you know, if I need to, I can read it again. All right. So it goes, of course, and it's an ancient Christian hymn. Today, the Virgin gives birth to the Transcendent One, and the earth offers a cave to the Unapproachable One. 
Angels with shepherds glorify him. The wise men journey with the star, since for our sake, the eternal God was born for us as a little child. I don't know if I telegraphed enough, enough what I was going to be getting at, but uh, anyway, this is a Christmas Kentucky, and it's words that I expect we're, you know, we're, we're used to. So again, set the stage. You walk into the church off uh, from Minneapolis into the sacred space. You hear these words, yeah? Experience reality. What does that mean? Carefully note here what is presented to us here. An event that is now taking place before us now, today. It's done today, not for X, Y, and Z, but for X, Y, and Z, and all the rest of it. It is done for us, for our sake. Coming into the church and experiencing a hymn like that is exactly what Father Alexander is saying. This is done for us now. We are a witness to this very event. The hymn doesn't say yesterday, 2,000 years ago. Zach, I don't know if you could sing that. 2,000 years ago. It's today. This is happening for us. You are very much a witness to this. And you, each of us, I don't mean to say you, we, all of us, we are intended to be caught up in that hour for our sake. Hmm? Now this hymn sings this to us. It gives us knowledge by explaining, you know, what is really going on. We come to church, yeah, what is going on? Well, this hymn explains so much to us. And of course, we all have an idea, ideas of what happens at the Feast of the Nativity or the Christmas holiday, in a kind of shorthand way of talking about the, the two things. Um, and I think in each of us, we have probably not only, uh, oh, what do you want to say, uh, an official idea of what Christmas is. You know, I've read Matthew and Luke. <laughs> I've seen Charlie Brown's Christmas. I know what it's all about. Uh, uh, we have, uh, you know, some, something of, a, of a, an official idea of what Christmas is about. But I think inside of us, we also, of course, and here, you know, I think we can be honest with each other. We also have privately held meanings. Yeah, and there might even be a public meeting that we hold in aggregate in our churches. You know, if I say, what does it mean to Christ what does Christmas mean to you? To me, sorry, I'm not going to lie. I love seeing my kids at Christmas. I love seeing my family at Christmas. I love seeing my parents at Christmas. And I bet no one would say, like a public meeting, that somehow, you know, being with family is unimportant at Christmas. I'm struck every year more and more at Christmas how many people put forward, you know, charitable goals at Christmas. And yeah, giving, not only giving presents, you know, there's a real clamor, a good clamor in society to make sure that everybody has something, that there is an opportunity to give at that moment. And that's great, and that's wonderful. Don't get me wrong um, for what I'm about to say. Um, people have taken one word from the angel's message to the shepherds peace, you know, peace on earth, and that's part of the public meaning of Christmas. Christmas is about family, charity, love, and peace. And don't get me wrong, I'm not advocating, oh, I'm not good for peace. I think charity is lousy and family is wretched. My kids are wretched, but uh, all of those things are, of course, very, very important. But you walk into church, and what do you hear? Today, the virgin gives birth, yeah? Ultimately, this is the meaning of Christmas that will save us by coming to know our Lord. Now, coming to know our Lord, I can short-circuit my topic, you know, what I'm going to say today. And coming to know him, we should then come out and indeed search for peace, offer charity, be good to our family, uh, and all of those sorts of things. But what will truly save us is our faith in God, yes, and our love for him. And we cannot love we cannot have faith in him unless our knowledge of him grows. And so coming into church, walking through those doors, hearing the Christmas Kantakian, we know that this is for us today. And what is given over to us today for our sakes is this revelation that this young girl uh, gives birth to the transcendent one. And this is one of those marvelous moments, you know? If you hear the hymn, uh, 
don't know what is it going to be about um, two months from today, more or less, and some change. You know, when you hear that, don't let it go in this ear and come right back out that ear. Hear the contrasts that are drawn out in that hymn. That you've got this young girl. I mean, you cannot get more vulnerable in the ancient world than this young girl. She's giving birth to the transcendent one. Yeah? Let that paradox, let that this contrast, don't let it go. Hold that together. I will come back to this in just a moment. But think about, you know, the earth personalized, offering something. And you know the word offering is exactly speaking about drawing near. But the word, you know, literally the offering in the kind of cultic language, you know, talks about off, making an offering by bringing it towards somebody. But the Gantagian is saying, the earth brings near a cave to the one that you can't bring near to. Yeah, again, don't let it come in this year and go out that year. And then of course we have the unity of heaven and earth with the shepherds and angel giving glory you know, to God for what is being done for our sakes. Yeah, and we're not excluding anybody here, don't get me wrong. And so I don't just say our sakes here in this room, but for our sakes. Something is happening in our midst now, here, today, according to this hymn. Uh, this event is actually happening exactly for us. And we are called, you know, to perceive, to see, to understand this event before us, to experience it, as Father Alexander said, and thus know the power and presence of our great God in our midst. You know, the fulfillment of the Christmas, uh, 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 the fulfillment of, uh, uh, of that Christmas promise in, in Matthew's gospel. Uh, it, the name will be Emmanuel. God is with us. Obviously, it's a prophecy of Isaiah. But God is with us. And this is what we experience here. Uh, this is, as Father Alexander said, this is the reality. We're not discussing whether or not it's the case. This is the reality presented to us. Now think back just for a minute uh, to the episode that I described at the outset of my talk. Metropolitan Leonti walking down the stairs, saying a few words after dinner. Father Alexander Schmemann was our guide and he explained what happened. You know, another way of looking at that event, you know, would have just been, oh yeah, there was an older man, he descended stairs, a bunch of men with long beards wearing cassocks, they had dinner, and that older man spoke Russian afterwards, and the meeting broke up. Father Alexander, he perceived something more uh, took place, you know? Our liturgical tradition does the same thing, yeah? It explains for us what has happened. Remember, remember what Luke's gospel says, what the angels revealed to the shepherds. They said, go to this place and there will be a sign for you. There's a sign for you. And the sign is, of course, uh, the baby, yeah? Wrapped in swaddling clothes. And they are to understand this sign. And exactly in the same way, what is presented to us in the church, yeah, is a sign that we are meant to understand. Of course, God is not the hymns, he's not the words. You know, what is used to reveal is not the same as what or who is revealed, yeah? So back to our hymn, just momentarily. Uh, it's sung according to melody, and the words describe something for us. But they describe something far greater than the melody, no matter how wonderfully they're sung, uh, far greater than the words, more profound, and ultimately, what is real? Because God became incarnate for us as a little child and has revealed himself to us. Let's take another example. So, this coming in the street, experiencing God, talked about the hymn. Uh, let's take another example, another common example uh, that we experience in the church all the time. <sighs> Consider for a moment uh, the bread and wine we receive at communion. Now, these two elements carry, like many things in the church, many, many meanings with them. It's hard to say, of course, that the bread and wine mean simply this. There are many things, and I'd like to unpack some of the things for us. Now, of course, preeminently, <clears throat> our Lord himself tells us, tells us what they are. He says that they are his body and his blood. And he further commands us that we should eat and drink of them. 
Now the great apostle, the apostle Paul, he tells us that when we do, as we do, we share in, we participate with all that Christ is. Partake of his body, we drink his blood. Indeed, the Lord again had said elsewhere that he who eats his flesh abides in him. Uh, and this, of course, eating his flesh is what we do when we receive communion. Our Lord, of course, gave us the, the, this mystery and the command to do it amidst his saving passion. And to this very day, we proclaim his death and his resurrection, you know, as often as we do it. One of my favorite... Uh, one of my favorite church fathers is a father called Nicholas Cabasilis. His name is Nicholas Cabasilis, and he wrote in the 14th century. He wrote a commentary on the Divine Liturgy that's available in a very fine English translation. I highly recommend it. He also wrote a commentary on the other mysteries of the church called the Life in Christ, and it's also very, very good. It's very profound. It takes. It requires you know slow and patient reading. It's not for you know the. It's not the first theological book that you would want to pick up, but it's definitely not the last. I, I highly encourage it. I think it's very good, very profound. He made a passing comment in one of his common, in one of his commentaries that he, he said, in fact, that the, uh, the bread and the wine are like little tablets on which are written the, 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 the passion of Christ. And so when we partake of them, we're not only partaking of Christ, but we're communing of this great passion, this great mystery of our salvation. I love that. I think that's just one of those beautiful elements of this and goes very much in line with what we're talking about. We partake of the body and blood of Christ. and it, We partake of his passion. And we allow his body and his blood to mix and mingle with our body, our tissues, our blood, our sinews. Truly, as he said, he abides in us and with us we and him. But this is all, you know, very kind of theological and exactly along the lines of what we would expect, you know. But I would add, there's a further dimension uh, to this saving mystery. The, uh, the bread and wine uh, are offered at the celebration of the liturgy according to the command of the Lord, but not simple grain or grapes or some sort of animal sacrifice. You know, water is not thrown at fire, and fire is not built, it's not consuming these sorts of things. Rather, it seems to me that God has in fact blessed us with intelligence and accepts that human intelligence that is put forward, um, bread and wine, he accepts this intelligence as a sacrifice. Yeah? Think about it. You know, what goes into making bread? Uh, that wheat had to be domesticated who knows how many millennia ago. That wheat has to be planted, it has to be harvested, it has to be milled. I'm not sure what all it has to be done. I'm just kind of, <laughs> I don't do it myself, but I you know, buy it in bags like anybody else, I suppose. But I know a lot of things go into it, to making the wheat that then goes into the bread. I've long thought, who was that first person who realized, you know, if you put this together with that together, wheat, and then you put a little bit of water and yeast and a little bit of salt, like one of the greatest things ever. Bread is that way, but wine is not far behind when it comes to the requirements of human intelligence. You know, wine, of course, uh, uh, the grapes had to be domesticated. They themselves had to be planted. The vines had to be tended, pruned. The grapes had to be harvested. Grapes, of course, at one point had to be tramped on. You had to get the little kids out there to tramp on the grapes and crush them. Um, and then all of that liquid had to be bottled and preserved. You know, I, I don't know this. But I have heard from people who make wine that the, the, the margin between making wine and making vinegar is like razor thin. Yeah? My wife and I, once when we were first married, we left a bottle of uh, red wine out when we went on vacation. I guess maybe the cork wasn't uh, in far enough and you know, went to drink of it. And I was like, oh, wow, I think that we need a salad for this rather than uh, a meal. I've had that happen in my father's church. That happened with communion wine once, too. It's slipped over to um, vinegar rather quickly. Anyway, the human intuition, the intelligence that had to go into all of these sorts of things, God accepts. God accepts them and receives them 
and review, sorry, reveals them for what they truly are, his body, his blood. In them, in our communion of them, we can read, yeah? We can see how things truly, really, most assuredly are when we read the sign, if you will, of bread and wine. Now I pause for just a moment um, and just remark on this, uh, this great marvel that God has chosen the things of creation, or not chosen, but God has allowed the things of this creation, material creation, to be sufficient. Hmm? To be sufficient, no matter how partial, eh? but he has allowed them to be used in revelation of him. I think, without exaggeration, the single most profound sentence in the whole of scripture is, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the rest of the Bible and the rest of Christian existence is simply unpacking that. God has revealed himself to us, and he reveals himself to us through creation. Now, I want to point out, I'm going to come back to this point a little bit in a little bit. Uh, but this point that God has revealed himself through creation is a fundamental presupposition of the liturgical tradition. He reveals himself to us through creation, deeming creation to be sufficient uh, to create, uh, to, to reveal his glory, his majesty. Okay, the deacon has alerted me. I've gone for about an hour. I'm going I'm to just stop here because we'll continue on with this. Maybe take some time for questions, uh, if there are any, and then we'll take a break, yes? And then I'll come back and continue with my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Father Alexander. Um, we have a break, you know, but uh, does anyone have any questions that they'd like to pose to Father Alexander? If we go on break, you know, everybody's going to forget what they have to say, but even if we go on break, you might remember something and you can come and ask me, or, you know, when we come back, you're going to ask again. But if there's anything at this point that you would like to bring up, and just for clarification, please. Um, so I completely understand how uh, beauty of the liturgy is transporting. And certainly here at St. Mary's, we have many opportunities to be transported like that. And goodness, I'm grateful. What can you say to people in situations where liturgically things are a bit rough? And there certainly is beauty and truth and all those things there, but it needs to be, <laughs> um, you need to look for it deeply. So what would you say to a parishioner who goes to a parish like that? Um, what would you say to people who are, who are learning to form the liturgical life in a new small parish, for instance, like that? Because here at St. Mary's, we are extraordinarily blessed. Those are great questions, and I, I thank you very much for them. And I promise to address some of them in, my, in my, the second part of what I talk about. You know, the, the short answer is, you know, the liturgy can be celebrated as beautifully as anything. I've had the good fortune to go to, you know, to Moscow. I have served a, hand, a number of times on Mount Athos, where they do the services, just unbelievable. Um, I've been to Constantinople, I've had the privilege to serve there. I've been throughout a lot of America and served. I just celebrated with Father Nicholas Harris in, uh, at his son-in-law's parish in uh, Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. And oh my gosh, what a beautiful service it was. Uh, nevertheless, no matter how beautiful the services are, I don't believe that anyone is a natural to them, you know, like a natural athlete. You don't just fall into the liturgical services and grasp them. For anybody, I think there are a couple of, there are a number of steps that have to be taken. And whether you're at a parish where they're, where they're working towards getting to a certain level, or even if you're at a parish where you have a magnificent choir, a fantastic core of clergy, and the services go on just very well, you know, nevertheless, anybody has to read the Bible regularly. You simply, I'm going to say it, you cannot understand the liturgy unless you have basic Bible literacy. Um, you have to say your own personal prayers regularly. It might help. I don't consider it a necessity, but um, it might help to have a study of the liturgy, a history of the liturgy and liturgics, you know. Uh, 
it's also good to be, uh, what do I want to say, have a guide to them, you know, have somebody mentor, that's the kind of language that we use now. And so I would say for almost anybody, you have to undergo those sorts of things. And I would say for people who feel very comfortable and derive great inspiration from the liturgical services, I bet there are people who guided you. I bet those you in your own life, I'm not talking about you, but I mean, you know, there's somebody that you have good literacy of the Bible, you have good familiarity that you might have learned through the services or something like that. Um, I imagine, you know, that you are a prayerful person. So, what I would say to that is everybody has to build those things up. But then, of course, there are the technical skills of liturgical life that have to be, have to be fostered. And I, I taught liturgics at St. Vladimir Seminary for a long time. It was a very difficult class for me to teach because, as I've said, I've served in the church for 52 and a half years. And it's very difficult for me when a student says, I don't understand this, Father, because I understand it like nobody's business. Um, and so when they say, I don't grasp it, or this took me three hours to do, or something like that, I don't know, you know. But I think by repetition, by practice, the, the, those sorts of skills can be brought, can be, have to be brought to bear, because it, it is difficult work, both through the practice, but it's also difficult work for the practice of engaging with the liturgical tradition. Does that help? I mean, I think these are very good questions. But I think some of them have to be answered by everybody, but then there's some particular that would be emphasized, plus you have the additional mechanical work of learning how to do it. I had a comment. I remember distinctly the talk that you gave us at St. Vladimir's at the DVP, and you started off, I think, it, I think the type, the lecture was supposed to be the meaning of the liturgy. Um, I think that's what you know, generally was supposed to be. And you started off by saying, I have no idea what the meaning of the liturgy is. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that or not. And I, I was struck by, I was like, what? <laughs> what? But later as you were talking, and, and maybe as I reflect on that, it's like, what's the meaning of the kingdom of God? You know, the breadth of it, the uh, thing, the, the, the idea that you can hold it all in and understand it all is, you know, I think that's what you were trying to We're going we're to get very much. That, that it's a continuing, it's a continuing unfolding um, and not just, you know, learning a few things. So we're, we're going to get, we're also going to get to that exact question with that exact point. Sorry. We're going to get to that exact point in my second, the second part of my presentation. What is given over to us? And because God, it, it, <laughs> Let me put it this way. We are so used to the material world revealing God that we don't stop to think what a paradox that is. That, I'm not going to break anything, wood, uh, the, the flecks of paint, metal, and all of these things are used to reveal God. We don't stop to think about that. And we, we, we look at an icon and we say there's, you know, an icon of Christ and we can immerse ourselves in the theology of that and we can say Christ was perfect man, perfect God, and we can talk about all of these things. But we have to remember that all of these images, everything that this church does, even the language that we use, the construction of words, these are all, these are, God is deemed sufficient, but they're only partial. There's no end to the revelation of God through human language, through material uh, creation that reveals God. There is no end to that revelation. And what it's termed is a mystery. We will never get to the end of it. We will never fully comprehend it. God has deemed it sufficient, but not complete. And I'm not saying in any way that it's not true and not authentic, but I'm saying it's incomplete because God is infinite. God is, we, his great, his eminence, excuse me, will say this tomorrow. God, you are ineffable, inconceivable. But nevertheless, we're addressing him. We're talking, you know, to him. We are using things of this word to, world to reveal to him. So what do we learn in the liturgy? We learn a considerable amount. And over the course of our life, I guarantee, you learn an even greater amount. But you don't come close to anything but a taste of who or what God is. So, 
We can maybe take a break now. Questions? Okay, well, we'll take a break. There's some refreshments outside um, on the lawn. Uh, there's coffee and uh, some refreshments outside. Right outside.